Good morning. I'm Charlotte Jackson. I'm a police officer here in the city of High Point. I've been here in High Point for about two and a half years, and I chose to read Tuck Everlasting this morning. Tuck Everlasting is a very timeless novel in more ways than one, um, and this is probably my first favorite book. Um, so this is Natalie Babbitt's Tuck Everlasting. The first week of August hangs at the very top of summer, the top of the live long year, like the highest seat of a Ferris wheel when it pauses in its turning. The weeks that come before are only a climb from balmy spring, and those that follow a drop to the chill of autumn, but the first week of August is the motionless and hot. It's curiously silent with, with blank white dawns and glaring moons, and sunsets smeared with too much color. Often at night there is a lightning, but it quivers all alone. There is no thunder, no relieving rain. These are the strange and breathless days, the dog days, when people are led to do things they are sure to be sorry for later. One day, one day at a time, not very long ago, three things happened, and at first there appeared to be no connection between them. At dawn, May Tuck set out on her horse for the wood at the edge of the village of Tree Gap. She was going there, as she did every ten years, to meet her two sons, Miles and Jesse. At noontime, Winnie Foster, whose family owned the tree gap wood, lost her patience at last and decided to think about running away. At sunset, a stranger appeared at the Foster's gate. He was looking for someone, but he did not say who. No connection, you would agree, but things can come together in strange ways. The wood was at the center, at the hub of the wheel. All wheels must have a hub. A Ferris wheel has one, as the sun is the hub of the wheeling calendar. Fixed points they are, and best left undisturbed, for without them, nothing holds together. But sometimes, people find this out too late. The road that led to Tree Gap had been trod out long before by a herd of cows who were there, to say the least, relaxed. It wandered along in curves and easy angles and swayed off up, it, up in a pleasant tangent to the top of a small hill, ambled down again between fringes of bee-hung clover, and then cut sideways across a meadow. Here its edges blurred, it widened and seemed to pause, suggesting tranquil bovine picnics, slow chewing and thoughtful contemplation of the infinite. And then it went on again and came at last to the wood. But on reaching the shadows of the first trees, it veered sharply, swung out in a wide arc as if for the first time it had reason to think where it was going and passed around. On the other side of the wood, a sense of easiness dissolved. The road no longer belonged to the cows. It became instead, rather abruptly, the property of people. And all at once, the sun was uncomfortably hot, the dust oppressive, and the meager grass along its edges somewhat ragged and forlorn. On the left stood the first house, a square and solid cottage with a touch-me-not appearance, surrounded by grass cut painfully to the quick, enclosed by a capable iron fence, four feet high, which clearly said, move on, we don't want you here. So the road went humbly by and made its way past cottages more and more frequent, but less and less forbidding, into the village. But the village doesn't matter, except for the jailhouse and the gallows. The first house only is important. The first house, the road, and the wood. There was something strange about the wood. If the look of the first house suggested you'd better pass by, so did the look of the wood, but for quite a different reason. The house was so proud of itself that you wanted to make a lot of noise as you passed, and even maybe throw a rock or two. But the wood had a sleeping, otherworld appearance that made you want to speak in whispers. This, at least, is what the cows must have thought. Let's keep its peace. We won't disturb it. Whether the people felt that way about the wood or not was difficult to say, but there were some, perhaps, who did. But for the most part, the people followed the road around the wood that was the way it led. There was no way through the wood, and anyway, for people, there was another reason to leave the wood to itself. It belonged to the Fosters, the owners of the Touch Me Not Cottage, and was therefore private property in spite of the fact that it lay outside the fence and was perfectly accessible. The ownership of land is an odd thing when you come to think of it. How deep, after all, can it go? If a person owns a piece of land, does he own it all the way down, in ever-narrowing dimensions till it meets all other pieces at the center of the earth? Or does ownership consist only of a thin crust under which the friendly worms have never heard of trespassing? In any case, the wood, being on top except, of course, for its roots, owned bud and burrow by the fosters and the touch-me-not cottage. 
And if they never went there, if they never wandered in among the trees, well, that was their affair. Winnie, the only child of the house, never went there. Though she sometimes stood inside the fence, carelessly banging a stick on the iron bars and looked at it, but she had never been curious about it. Nothing ever seems interesting when it belongs to you, only when it doesn't. And that was interesting anyway, about a slim few acres of trees. There will be dimness shot through with the white bars of sunlight, and a great many squirrels, and birds, and deep, damp mattresses of leaves on the ground, and all the things just as familiar, if not so pleasant things, like spiders and thorns and grubs. In the end, however, it was the cows who were responsible for the wood's isolation, and the cows, though some wisdom they were not wise enough to know that they possessed, were very wise indeed. If they had made their road through the wood instead of around it, then people would have followed the road. The people would have noticed the giant ash tree at the center of the wood, and then, in time, they'd have noticed a little spring bubbling up among its roots, in spite of the pebbles piled there to conceal it. And that would have been a disaster so immense that this weary old earth, owned or not to its fiery core, would have trembled on its axis like a beetle on a pin. I'm Charlotte Jackson. This is Tuck Everlasting by Natalie Babbitt. If you'd like to read more about Tuck Everlasting and find out what happens, you can come to the High Point Library and check this out. <laughs>